Hey folks, welcome to another anthology. It's been a while since the first one, I'll admit, and like I say, January, February, you don't tend to get a lot of actual good game releases. You get some, but they're usually remnants from 2018's Essen, they're not really like the new hotness. That's why there's not been that much detail reviews or anthologies lately. But I figured it was about time I got off the whole top 10 and solo play craze lately and just thought, you know what, I need to review some games, even if they are like leftovers from Essen or some recent ones. In fact, actually, nah, there's only one I would consider that recent. The rest of them sort of came out round Essen time, slightly before. So, you know, you will have heard of, I think, all or most of these titles. But I figured that some of them deserved a decent review, or at least the first impressions. So without further ado, we'll make a start. First off, I want to go to a publisher that I'm quite a fan of, actually. I don't love everything they do, but when it comes to their smaller games, I seem to get a kick out of them. They just give you this great bang for your buck feel. One of my favourites from them is Hannah Makoji, one of my favourite two-player games of all time. And this one, I wasn't sure what to make of it, but Walking in Burano. It's an, the latest one in their little box line. They kind of got several different lines and they numbered them in a the series. I basically, when I went to Essen, thought, you know what, I like Hannah Makoji, and just bought out the rest of their little game stock. And this one was the one that they were showcasing. And all I'd heard was that, you know, Sam Healy on the Dice Tower had been going on about it and saying, okay, this is a decent little card game. So what's it all about? It's basically that you're you're building a row of five houses, three stories high, and the idea is is that you will draft cards from this uh, layout that everybody picks from, and you're effectively trying to build the houses in such a way so that the various icons that are pictured on them, like cats and pedestrians and plant pots, that sort of thing, are prominent in the houses, so that when you complete the house, you get to draw from a, um, several stacks of cards where you've got tourists and inhabitants that score based on their particular likes. So one, for example, wants your entire house to be full of green plant pots. Another one might want you to have all the pedestrians that you can on the bottom street, and so on and so forth. And it's essentially just on your first turn, you know, take some money in cards or vice versa, and then decide whether you want to play a certain amount of cards in your grid meeting certain criteria. Obviously the house must follow a logical sense, but you also must try and make them the same colour, but also not make them the same colour next to each other. Although you can sacrifice some points to do, you know, just that and break a couple of the rules. It's a nice, simple little card game, and I didn't think I was going to fall in love with it, but, you know, okay, I'm not going to say it's the best thing since sliced bread, but every time I've brought it out, everybody's liked it, and I just find it to be one of those kind of little zen like charming little games really it's very colorful because you've got all the different bright colors of the houses it's basically based on a an area called Burana, which i believe is around venice if i'm not mistaken um correct me if i'm wrong on that one my geography is not always 100 percent but and it's just nice and simple you know the components are fairly basic we're not talking stellar here and the cards are fairly small but then you don't need text on cards or anything it's all iconography the reference sheet tells you everything you need to know so it's easy to explain the game it's easy to explain the turn sequence so once you've set up you can get going in a matter of minutes nice and quick and the game doesn't take more than about 45 minutes maximum an hour and that's if you've got slow players at four at the four count but less than that you're talking less than an hour 45 minutes for a solid little card game because you've got to you've got to think about right well I need these I want this house to be all green right well I need those green bits but but there's a pink bit there in the middle it's got all the cats I need for this particular tourist is it worth sacrificing three points to do it uh, maybe and you've got the tension that people will take the cards from you because the turn order keeps shifting around. So you might be last in turn order and you look at the tableau and it's like, don't put the yellow, don't put the yellow. And someone takes it, you curse their name and you try and think of a better strategy. But, you know, you can chop and change what you're doing during the game. You know, you've, you've got five houses to build. You're not necessarily, you might say at the start, right, well, I'm going to make certain that I focus on plant pots. Well, that's all well and good. But then you might notice someone else is doing that and you think, Maybe it's worth building my third, fourth, and fifth house in a different fa manner. In which case you can. You can actually shift your strategy a little bit because it's mostly a tactical game. You have to react to what's there. It's like if the cards come out and you think, oh, there's a lot of pinks um, and that one's got a lot of cats. Well, that inhabitant's still there. I better hurry up and build this pink house. And, and it, it kind of just works really nicely. Simple, light, gateway level, 
and I'd be hard pressed to call it gateway level, but I would say it's easily a next step. There's not a lot of rules, but maybe the whole building the house and knowing what all the inhabitants do, maybe that's a bit above the gateway level, but it's certainly a next step. Solid little card game, staying in the collection. I put it in the bag most of the time because it just fills that useful niche. You know, you're waiting for the bigger game to start or you've traveled to a convention, you just need something light for the evening. Walking in Burano does just that. Two to four players, and it even, I believe, has a... I haven't even tried it, actually, I must admit. Yeah, there's a solo play included as well. You know, I haven't even tried it. I've just enjoyed playing two, three, and four player of this. But uh, maybe I might break out the solo player later. So, walking in Burano. For me, it's a solid eight. It's a really nice little card game. Just does what it says on the tin. Gives you a light, little zen feeling when you don't want the game to take forever or overwhelm it. Next up, we're going to talk about a game that I feel is going to go under the radar for many people. And it's a shame because this legitimately is a nice family co-op game. It's from Foxtrot Games, but Renegade have also put it out. And I saw it at Essen and thought, hmm, Spy Club, this looks a little bit kiddish. Maybe I'm not going to go mad for it. But the demo was free. And to be honest, it was a nightmare trying to get into an architect's demo. So I thought, you know what, I'll play what I can. Sat down into this and it's basically portrayed as a two to four player, you know, light co-op game with a campaign element in, a sort of semi-legacy feel. It's like, okay, every time the word legacy gets plastered onto a game these days or campaign, I'm a little bit worrisome. But as I went through, forgetting that whole legacy aspect, we'll get onto that in a bit, but the, the crux of it is that you are a bunch of kids in your cliche, typical, like, you know, 80s style spy club, you know, it's like the little girl with the magnifying glass and the, the geeky kid on a bicycle, you know, think that kind of setting, you know, the Scooby-Doo gang, if you will, <laughs> just without the dog. And the idea is, is that you have the, you're trying to solve a case, but the way you do it is a little abstracted. This is not like Chronicles of Crime, we'll get onto that later, <laughs> you know, or any other deduction game. It's more a tableau, I suppose a card management game is the best way I can put it. The idea is, is that you have three cards in front of you and there's different colors, uh, one color for objects, one color for people, one color for location, that kind of thing. And the idea is, is that you have a central board and you're trying to get five different cards, but with the same color on it laid out. When you do so, you pick one of them to be the actual object or location you're looking at and it goes into the scoring board. And basically you're trying to do that for all the colors. Of course, like with all co-ops, there's one way to win, a million ways to lose. You can run out of ideas, which is this light bulb resource that uh, drains away over time. You've also got the suspect themselves. You know, they have a little piece that moves around your various tableaus, and depending on what color they land on, they trigger some negative effect. They could drain your ideas out completely, in which case lose the game. They might trigger a little track that shows that the suspect has escaped, in which case you, were, you took too long, you know, they've got away. And I think there's another one. Oh yeah, and the deck running out. You know, you just took too long to do the case anyway. But what's really cool is there's a lot of good teamwork in this. I mean, you could say there's a minor problem of an alpha player, but that's a player issue, not a game issue. I never like thinking alpha player is an issue with these sort of co-ops. But for the most part, you have to work together because with the cards in front of you, you might have a mixture of colors and you have the ability to like certain actions, you can draw more, you can discard, you can put them on the central board or you can flip them over because they're double sided. So it might be red on one side, it might be uh, you know purple on the next, or it might be a gray card, which is a distraction. It doesn't do any good for you in terms of teamwork or the case, but if the suspect lands on it, it means they don't do anything negative. So there's a, you know, a touch and go there. But what I love about this is, firstly, it looks really nice. It's very colorful, very pretty. The cards are huge, they're like tarot size. So it's a pops on the table. It's perfect for the family and kids setting. And the teamwork aspect's really cool because the idea is that you have this little magnifying glass. It's a focus marker. And when it's on a card, if somebody else around the table has their magnifying glass on a card of the same color, you're both in sync. And the idea is, is that that allows you to trade ideas as a resource, but also allows you to trade actual cards because you're trying to set yourself up in such a way that you can get them onto that central board and eventually score them. It's just a really neat but simple mechanic that means that teamwork is key. You're there at the table discussing with each other and it's like, I've got two reds here. They're not useful, but hang on. You know, Ali, if you sync with that one over there, then I can give you the ideas. Then when it gets around to your turn, you can score those. You'll take those cards from the top of the deck, which are green. If the suspect lands on that, not a big deal. Yeah, and there's it's discussions like that all over the place. So 
as a typical game, and you could play this solo. I mean, you don't have to play it two to four players. If you really want to play it solo, just control two boards. Easily done. But I haven't got on to the most interesting bit yet. The legacy aspect. It's not like typical legacy. You don't burn bits up. You don't throw the game away afterwards. It's not like that. You have a deck of, fairly big deck of cards. And when you do the first case, it then tells you to look at certain cards in this deck. They're all numbered. It's a bit like, um, uh, I'm trying to think, is it kind of like Gen 7 or, um, I don't know, I'll take too long. But, you know, those sort of games where the deck is numbered. So you've got to look at specific bits, maybe like Time Stories. And the idea is, is that depending on what one you chose to be your final clues at the end, you have to look up certain cards. And they have story elements, but they also have ways that the rules change, like winning conditions or more things that can go wrong or just weird little bonuses you get in the next game. And then when you play the next game, the same thing occurs. You look up the certain numbered cards, you get them out and you follow it and it changes up the game a bit. And you play through a campaign of five games in this manner before you wrap up and say, right, did we solve the master case, this overarching story that is behind all these little things like, you know, Jenny went to the ice cream store and stole an ice cream because she was jealous about the owner. I don't know, you know, you can make up, you basically make up whatever silly little story I like. You're a spy club, you're not here, so you're not dealing with multiple homicide here. And it's just, again, it's nice and charming, but it's straightforward, turns are fast, you're always involved because you have, even if you can't do much with your cards, you're discussing with everybody, so it works as a co-op. And that deck is big. There's a lot of cards there. I guarantee you. I mean, I've nearly finished a campaign with a group of mine. And I played another campaign solo. And it was completely different. Different cards came out each time. You could get a lot of replay value out of this game. I mean, a lot. Is For what is not an expensive game, it's an easy one. Just colourful cards, you know, a few boards and stuff like that. Simple, but effective. Graphic design is easy to follow. The turn sequence is easy to follow. You've even got reference aids. It just does the trick. And the game takes no more than about 45 minutes to play a single game of it. Possibly even less if you've not done very well or you've got zooming through it with maybe two players. But four players, each game should be about 45 minutes when you know what you're doing. It's quick. You could binge through a whole campaign one day if you really want. Or you could just say, you know what? We've got a bit of time before we play Scythe, for example. Let's just play one more game on the, on the Spy Club campaign. This is solid. I think this is a perfect game for families. I mean, gateway level? Maybe. It's really not that difficult a game. I could call this gateway level. Maybe next step, a bit like Burano. But it just fits that slot. There's not a lot of games out there that I've sort of got behind and said... This is perfect for families and perfect for new gamers and can introduce kids. I don't have kids. I'm not planning to have them. I'm not a kid expert. You know, I, I stand up and, you know, admit that. But this just seems to work. It's, I fear it's going to get underrated. I fear this is going to go under the wayside because people are going to look at this cutesy cover. It's called Spy Club. Nobody knows a huge amount about Foxtrot games, I don't think. And, you know, I, that saddens me a little because I think if you like co-ops, and you want a family level game that adults can enjoy as well. I mean, I play with adults. I don't play with kids. And we're enjoying it. I enjoy it. I played it solo. I enjoyed it. It's a, you know, I don't, it's not mind blowing. But it, it just, again, puts you in a good mood. It's charming. You can role play it a bit just for a bit of a laugh. Simple, effective, and has a lot of replay value. It's got a lot going for it. And I just, I fear it's going to go under the wayside. For me... Hard to say what I think of this one. Um, I mean, the gameplay can get a little bit repetitive maybe in between games, mainly just because you are doing the same sort of actions and that over the time. But I, I would give it a seven personally, you know. I It's not one that I'm going to pull out every single time. But if I want a quick family game, this is a solid one you can you should consider, honestly. I, I'm praising it a lot more than the seven feels like it is. But this is just my personal, like, am I going to bring this game out all the time? I think this is going to sit well with a lot of people. Give it a look, Spy Club. Now we're going to get on to something similar to Spy Club. I mentioned it a second ago, but not quite the same thing. And that is the, oh my word, this is so lauded at the moment, Chronicles of Crime. Now, I don't remember the full story behind it, but somebody who, I can't remember if it was a relative or a friend of Ignacy Trevacek, designed and like went through with this game. So at the same time, that detective, uh, the big portal one was being done, 
And they knew they were building the same game, but they were fundamentally different. And they are fundamentally different games, even though they are about being detectives and doing deduction. So if you own one, you can own the other. Um, hello, you know, case in point. Uh, where is my detective? Oh yeah, there it is. There's my Chronicles. I even kickstarted it. So what's it about? Again, your detectives trying to solve a murder case, you know, well, or a case, not necessarily a murder. And this one is done with an interesting little gimmick with an app. You effectively have your mobile phone handy. And what you'll do is you'll basically scan lots of QR codes. All the cards, all the locations, all the clue things have got QR codes on them. And so what you'll do is that the app, you will run it through the app and it will have story elements, not, not nowhere near like the detective one in terms of its content. You know, these are simple stories, but they've got very good plot arcs. They've got lots of hidden secrets that you have to find out, you know. And what you'll do is say, I want to question this lady here. You'd scan the QR code and it will say like, hello, what can I do for you? Or well, get out of my face, I ain't got time for you people. And then you scan it over another object, like say uh, the, I don't know, the vehicle, like a car left at the scene. You scan it there and then she'll talk to you in reaction about the car. And then you could go to a different person, scan the exact same QR code and you'll get a different response. And this happens with objects and locations and even some consultants that you have, like a forensic scientist, a, a psychologist, a doctor. And it's a really cool deduction game. You know, it, it's simpler by far than Detective, but it's by no means much easier to figure out. You know, Detective is definitely like the expert level deduction game, and I do love Detective. This is more like the intermediate slightly hard level of deduction. You know, the, the actual rules are a lot more simpler. I mean, you go through the tutorial mission in this, it will teach you everything you need to know, and then you can get on with the rest of the content. But certainly the missions are not a cakewalk. I mean, I've done some missions in there and I've gone, oh yes, I figured it out all good and good. And then there are some where I've got, oh, okay, um, here's my badge. <laughs> you know, so not as well. There's a few missions in the box. You can get expansions. I think we're in the Kickstarter, but I think they're coming out any day now if they haven't already, which is like a noir setting and a like street gang setting. You know, these look really cool. They're different styles, different rule sets. And you know, it means that the content is just gonna keep coming out and coming out and coming out because all they gotta do is just update the app. Now, as much fun as this is, it's not perfect. And a lot of that has to do with the app itself. The app is really good. It's for the most part, bug free, but it has some fiddly aspects to it that I'm not a huge fan of. Firstly, the whole looking over a crime scene. You can go to a crime scene and it'll say, would you like to look it over? And you basically, you either use the glasses in there, which is just a bit like annoying and fiddly, or you just use a panoramic view on the phone. And the idea is, is that you, <laughs> got it in this horrible case, but, and the idea is that you, you look at it, and you sort of look at the ground, 360 view, and you can see the entire scene. So you look at objects and you shout them out to the other players and they get the clue cards in response. Now, that has two issues. Firstly, it gives you a time limit to do it with. Why? You've got all the time in the world to do it, 45 seconds? I know you, you're under a time limit in the game, but 45 seconds is not a lot of time. You know, if it's supposed to represent 45 minutes in actual real time, then can't you at least just give me freedom to look at the, the thing as much as I want? It just seems like an unnecessary restriction. But on top of that, uh, there's two more other problems. Firstly, if you're playing this game solo, have fun with that because you've basically got to look at the scene and then once you've put it down, remember what all the clue cards you were going after because normally you would shout them out and somebody else can look through them. But now you've got to do it yourself. So it makes solo play with this a little bit fiddly. And thirdly, and this is probably the biggest issue I have with that looking thing, if you miss a certain detail, usually because you've glossed over it or it wasn't or it was particularly well hidden, it could mess you up the whole campaign. You know, I've had one campaign where I, I missed one item in a room and it just fundamentally changed my outcome because I missed one item on this 360 degree gimmick. That's annoying. I mean, granted, I suppose that's more representative of real life, but, you know, I'd rather fail the mission because I didn't figure out the puzzle or didn't figure out the clue. But to have it just simply because, oh, well, you just weren't able to look at this photograph in much detail, then you mess it up, that irked me on occasion. But like I said, that's more of a bit of a nitpick. Um, in terms of the app itself, again, you have this issue where you have to scan the QR codes in order to do a conversation. If you don't scan the specific thing with the specific other thing, 
you could miss out on a chunk of plot. And you don't necessarily know that the two gel together. It's like, I had one scenario where it's like, oh, I've got to go dig up some things in this uh, location. Okay, fine. Well, I know I need to dig something up there. Okay, there's a little girl there. Okay, great. Well, show me where it is. Hello, girl. Hello. <laughs> you know, it's, a, it's a, come on, seriously? You have to scan a you have to scan the girl with a particular item. And it's not even an item that you think has anything to do with this before she takes you to the place and then you dig up stuff. I mean, minor spoilers. But, and that just got on my nerves because it's like, how was I supposed to know I was meant to scan that particular item in order to do it? I know I need to be here. I know I need to be here. It, it, it's frustrating. And of course, you've got the fiddliness with the app where constantly I do this, where you're talking to someone and you scan various objects and you finish the conversation. Then you think, oh, I want to talk to the forensic scientist now. And then because you forget to tap goodbye on the app to say you stop talking to someone, you scan the forensic and you waste time in the game because the person says, I don't know this person. They say, oh, for God's sake, <laughs> goodbye. And I've done that so many times and it's aggravating. So I like the game. It's great. I really look forward to trying out the other different types of content. I think the noir setting is going to be particularly good, but it's not flawless. It, it can get frustrating with the app. Granted, some of this could be attributed to my fault rather than the app's fault, but constantly having to remember, right, I've got to say goodbye to this person before I scan that. You know, you, you get into the mood and you'll forget about it. The whole 360 thing is nice, but again, you miss out one component and it could mess you up the whole plot arc. And it's not like you can just go back into the thing and do it again because obviously you know the story. So replay value is based on new content, not on going back to the same mission again. So it's a hit and miss affair. I still like it though. I still think it's good fun. The app things can get a little bit annoying though and cooperative wise, don't play this with born three players. I mean, two people to grab the clue cards and that is all well and good. Personally, I don't mind playing it solo and at most I'd probably wanna play it two players. Four players is just too much. There just simply isn't enough for other players to do. So I do like it. I, I don't regret kickstarting it. I've got it. I wanna go through the rest of the content. But it's not going to measure up to Detective for me. For me, Chronicles would probably get a high 7, possibly an 8. You know, because I do really enjoy it. But those fiddliness with the bugs and the, the lack of content for the, like, the extra players to have, it, it does hinder it a little bit. So I've got to drop it down. But it's a solid game. And if you're a deduction fan, I definitely recommend you give it a try. Especially if you want something a little bit simpler than Detective. Oh, getting warm in here. We're getting into the spring. Right, next up, let's go for an expansion. In fact, let's, uh, yeah, let's keep it to the next two big expansions. This one is an expansion that was in the works for so long. I mean, we were just waiting for Caberner to have an expansion, and finally it does with the Forgotten Folk. Unfortunately, storing it in the main box, not going to happen, so I just keep the other little box now. Put simply, what does Forgotten Folk do? It brings you racial setups and pair powers. Finally, <laughs> so I don't have to be just generic dwarfs. With this one, you effectively get given this, you know, smothering of different races, and they have different setups, they have different bonuses and penalties, like, you know, some like can get you goblins, some can get you mushrooms, some hate being outside, some love being, you know, outside in general, some can overlap tiles over the edge of the board so you can make your humongous farms, you know, uh, some can only eat rocks. There's all sorts of weird and wonderful races in here from typical fantasy setting. And, and they come with their own little rooms, you know, so they've got four different building tiles that you swap out the originals with. So people that complained before, well, it's the same buildings all the time. The replay value is not there. <laughs> Insert this and whoo, it goes through the roof. Because now those, that race uh, takes four original tiles and replaces it with their four. And obviously players will play different races. So different buildings are going to swap in and out of every game. And so you've got all those combinations. Replay value, whoo, it's gone up. But the races themselves are great. There's a couple that are harder, I think, to use than others, but the rule book actually goes out of its way to tell you that. So, okay, they're not 100% balanced, but they're great fun. You know, if you're an expert at Caverner, then by all means, play the elves or play the uh, scaffolds or scaloids or something. Uh, I don't know, rock people. <laughs> you know, play them because they require a bit more effort. But it now opens up different combinations, variable player powers. 
you know, different strategies, different paths to victory. I have seen so many different ways of playing now compared to usual in Caverna by these races being used. Unusual strategies that normally wouldn't be done before. I mean, just the simple thing of, right, you now start with a third worker. It's a titty little goblin, and goblins are not particularly, you know, as adept at weapon fighting or at collecting resources and that, you know, because they drop them and that. But you have a third person at the start of the game. Normally it takes a good four to five rounds before anybody even thinks of getting their third person. So what can you do with that level of acceleration? And it just opens up new possibilities. You know, it's not the most, ex not the cheapest expansion to grab because you've got all the boards, you've got the building tiles and that. But there's not much else to say about this. It's eight different folks, as they call them, and 32 new furnishing tiles with different abilities and that. If you are a fan of Caverna, there is no way you are passing this up. There is no reason you would not grab this expansion if you like Caverna. If you like Caverna but you feel that the replay value has gone down a bit, again, there is no reason you would not pick this up. This is probably not necessary if you've only just bought Caverna because it introduces more rules and maybe it's a little bit much for your first couple of games, but honestly, I absolutely love it. I, want, I love Caverna. It's a top 20 game for me, as you probably know from my top 100s, and it just... Like I say, this now gives me variable setups, inserts a fresh, some freshness to the game, gives me replay value. What more can I say? The Forgotten Folk is amazing. It is one of my favorite expansions from last year. We've wanted it for so long <laughs> and we finally have it. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You know, Caverna, the Cave Farmers, the Forgotten Folk, a must buy. Next up, I don't actually own this game, so this is more kind of second play impressions. I don't, I haven't played it enough to do like the full on review. I've played it twice and you know, I can sort of give my thoughts. This is a new game called Raccoon Tycoon. It is essentially, I think it was a Kickstarter one. It's done by Glenn Drover, the same person who did Age of Empires, Age of Discovery and all that, whatever reprint version you've got. And it's basically supposed to be touted as a gateway level or at least an entry level market trading game in the sense that you have a bunch of resources that are different market prices and you effectively keep buying and selling these various goods in order to collect railroad cards which are basically just sets set collection uh, to build towns which is basically just a card with victory points on it and to obviously earn money and pay money whether in auctions or otherwise it's a fairly straightforward game. You know, your turn sequence is basically a case of, right, I play a card, it produces this certain stuff for me, but then it also, you know, raises the price of certain goods by a certain amount. And then as you're going around the table, people are thinking, hmm, is now the time to bid for one of those railroad cards? Or should I build a town because I've got the resources? But, ooh, hang on a minute, uh, metal's pretty high in price at the moment. He's likely to sell his metal, and when you sell it, it drops the price down. So you're thinking... Maybe I should sell my metal. I could get a good chunk of money. And money's not worth... I don't think it's worth victory points at the end of the game at all. But, you know, you need money in order to do the various things. So you can't just hoard too much money. But you can get buildings to give you special bonuses. And, of course, they're expensive. So you have to juggle money around just like a typical commodity trading game. The artwork in this is really good. I mean, they've used the anthropomorphic animals type things. So you've got like, you know, raccoons and uh, cats and dogs and various other animals on these railroad cards to basically like, it's set collection. So you've got like four raccoons, you've got four dogs and four cats, etc., and four skunks for some reason. Why would the skunk make a railroad? I don't know. But And you've got the towns. They've got lovely artwork on them as well. The board itself, simple and good artwork. Component quality is pretty sound as well. You've got proper wooden tokens for the various uh, resources. So it's not like you just get like a token or anything. You get a proper wooden piece. So production-wise, it's a pretty solid affair. Then it gets into the gameplay and it's hit and miss. Firstly, what did it set out to do? It set out to be a short, entry-level commodity trading game. It certainly is a commodity trading game. It certainly is an entry level one. The rules to this are very straightforward. If you want to teach someone how to do this whole commodity trading thing of buying and selling goods and that, this is definitely a game you should pick up as your first entry point. It is that easy to get into. Short. I played this with five players the first time and the game went on to about the two hour mark, including teaching. Granted, that might have been 90 minutes, maybe an hour and three quarters, but with the downtime I had and everything else, that's not short. I don't consider 
an hour and a half to two hours as a short game. I consider less than 60 minutes as a short game. I've just done Walking in Burano, 45 minutes, half an hour or so, short game. Spy Club, same thing, short game. An hour and a half to two hours is not short. So you're basically doing a simplified version of a game that you would normally expect to take two hours, but you're doing this one in two hours. You know, if I'm gonna play a commodity trading game for two and a bit hours, which to be honest, it's not really a theme I go for, so I'm not exactly desperate to, but you know, I would play a more involved one with more rules and more complexity. This one I would expect to take 60 minutes or less, and you can. Subsequently, I played it with only three players, and it was a lot faster. I think it was about 75 minutes we got it done in. Um, a lot of it depends on what you do in the markets and how often you get money. So the gameplay kind of fluctuates between 60 to 120 minutes. So there's quite a wide margin in there, depending on what you do. You can play it with up to five players, but again, I think that this is a mistake. I think they just put five players to sell more copies like they normally do, because as soon as you put more players in, it just becomes chaos. With three or less players, you've got a clear sight of what the market's going to do. And you've got to push your luck a bit, but you can sort of control what you're doing. Four players, it's a little bit more chaotic, but it's not as bad. It depends what people are doing. Five players, though, it's just complete randomness at times. You know, you might have a bunch of resources. It's like, oh, now it's gone up in price. I could sell those. And by the time it gets around to you, it's already gone back down because so-and-so before you has already done it in response to another player who went before you. On top of that, you get cards come out like the town cards, you know, you don't know what town is coming out and what resources it needs and you might have a bunch of resources there and it just doesn't happen to be the one you want. And you collect a bunch of resources from production cards and the cards you draw from there, again, you might just draw cards that just don't produce the things you want. There's a lot of randomness in this game and the chaos factor with five players just irks me a bit. So I would only want to play this with four max Ideally, three or less, I would say. But overall, the game works fine. There's only so much I can really say about it. It's a commodity trading game, which we've seen too many of. It's not a fun theme. I mean, the theme in this game is completely wasted, certainly for a star. The whole thing of putting animals on the cards means absolutely nothing. You could literally make one red, one blue, one yellow. It makes no difference. It is purely there in order to sell fancy artwork. You know, the theme in this game is pretty much just I am buying and selling goods. And the goods aren't even that interesting. You've got wheat, metal, coal, luxury goods, goods, whatever. And the only difference between them is a minor, and I mean minor, difference in what their prices can be. That's it. Apart from that, all the six resources are one like 90% generic. And it's just and the railroad card, it's just set collection. Oh, look, I'm gonna bid on this skunk railroad. It's uh I've got two in the set, he's got one, it's worth more victory points to me. And then you have this long drawn out auction, and I'm not a fan of auctions either. I mean, power grid, you know, they go on forever. These ones go on a bit forever as well. And the numbers just get out of whack. They've got minimum bids on them, like three coins, minimum bid, five coins, minimum bid. By the time you get to the mid late game, that minimum pricing is completely pointless because the thing will sell for like 20 something plus and possibly more. You know, the numbers just start at small amounts and then just skyrocket to ridiculous levels. It sort of just throws itself out of balance. So I know that's kind of what you would half expect in a commodity trainings game, but it's kind of like, why have the minimum bid there if you literally, if it's going to be ignored after like, you know, 10 minutes of the game is done. And like I say, part of this is possibly because I'm just not a huge fan of this theme in general, but you basically just sit there and buy and sell goods and then collect a set of cards and you are railroaded, no pun intended, on this path. The only way to win this game is to get the railroad cards. You need the railroad cards and you need to pair them up with a town each because you get bonus victory points for that. But that's it. That's the only path to victory you have. The bonus points you can get from a couple of buildings aren't enough. They're just a little bit extra. They're not worth going for as a strategy. Money is worth nothing at the end of the game, so it doesn't matter what goods you've got. You've got a mission objective for each player, but it's just simply like collect the most of this or collect the most of that, would be do, nothing interesting. So you have to get these railroad cards. You have to get those town cards. That's it, one path to victory. So already after two games, it feels very repetitive. I'm, I can't decide I wanna do what I wanna do. I just need to gun for a set of red cards and pair them up with some green cards. Doesn't matter what green cards, the green cards are just escalating victory points. There's no special ability or anything. It's just, what's the cost to get them? 
just would have been nice to have had a little bit more interest or variety in there. I just feel that the replay value of this is just going to go down the toilet. You know, one path to victory, same thing every game, chaos with too many players. It's all right. It does what it says on the tin. Simple commodity trading. But yeah, I'm bored with it already. You know, I mean, for me, probably, I'd probably go six. I'd, I'd give it a six. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to seek this game out. I'm not going to own it. I'm not going to ask to be, to be brought, but I don't hate it. You know, as long as it would be a five if I was playing this with five players again, because it really doesn't work with five players. But four or less, certainly three or less, I could bump this to a six. It's fine. It achieves what it's set out to do, but it just it doesn't have enough to captivate me. Raccoon Tycoon. And finally, we're going to go to some psychedelic -y type artwork here. I'm going to do final expansion time, and that is this... Oh, oh, so pretty thing behind me. Totally liquid for Dinosaur Island. Now, this is the extreme version. I went all out on the Kickstarter, but that is in no way influencing my decision on the game. I'm not going to talk... I mean, the components in the retail version of this are still really good. The Kickstarter ones are amazing, but, you know, the component quality is already good. We know this from the original Dinosaur Island. But what does this expansion add? It's a modular expansion. Again, great. I like modular expansions because then you can cherry pick the ones that you like or make it sort of introduce a little bit each time. But it adds a lot more variety to the game as if it didn't already have a lot of variety. Now, weakest element, it adds a fifth player and fifth player components. Don't care. Don't want to play this for five players. Screw that. I might as well put them in a spares box because I'm never going to use them. In fact, I think aside from the extra board, they are... They are essentially put in a little bag and I don't open the bag because the game's long enough with four. You have to play this game with medium or long difficulty. And if I play it with four, that's already a long game. If I play this with five, the downtime in between like the little actions, especially if you get the AP player, would just be insane. I don't want that. And as much as I love Dinosaur Island, I mean, the original was a 10. I have to admit, it's mostly multiplayer solitaire, except for the tension of being blocked on certain dice and that. But... The whole idea of building the park is just so much fun, I don't care. But yeah, why would I want to add a fifth player? Totally pointless, just there to... I bet it was just there as a kind of, oh, we can put this in as a stretch goal or something. I don't know, I wasn't following the Kickstarter that well, but yeah. Five player, don't care, there. But on the positive notes, <laughs> you have, firstly, they've changed up the rules slightly for how many objectives you use in a short, medium and long game with different player counts because it was a little bit unbalanced in the first one. I mean, you never played a short game ever. And certain the jump from medium to long was also quite a stretch. Now they give you a revised chart where it says this player count, this length, this many objectives. It certainly does a nice job in just sort of balancing things out. That's a minor thing. But then you've got the modules, the ones that are really good. Firstly, marine creatures. You can now, you know that ma massive giant fish thing in Jurassic World and that? Well, now you can make them yourself. You grab the recipe, they require specific scientists, and you basically have a separate habitat with this giant pool, and you put a blue, like, meeple thing in there as a dinosaur, and it basically gets you victory points and excitement and threat in the same way. But what's really cool about these is that they have very different effects. There is one marine creature, um, we, we made two in the last game, we had two different recipes, because, you know, people weren't grabbing them as much, but one of them that my opponent had gave a ton of excitement. It gave a huge amount of threat. I mean, it was like, I'm going to eat everything and everyone. But it didn't give a lot of victory points. So it was a big excitement booster. And then the one I grabbed gave me not a huge amount of excitement, just one excitement. Very, like, no threat at all. It was like a completely docile creature. But it gave me five victory points each time I made one because it required, I think, five or six different basic DNA. Sweet. Two fundamentally different creature stats with just two recipes, and the rest are all various, you know, that some are insanely carnivorous, and some of them are herbivores, and, you know, and they vary, and it was just a nice little addition to the game. You can teach it really easily, they function just like normal dino recipes, they just have their own little separate habitat, and another space for a scientist to grab. That's pretty much all you need to know about the marine dinosaurs, easy include, auto include, more variety of recipes, what's not to like. Uh, uh, what's next on that? Uh, you have you have blueprint objectives. So you're given a you're given a choice out of blueprint cards, and you uh, you can basically it tells you how you should build your park. So I want food stuff here, I want recipe stuff there, and the more you can match it, the more victory points at the end. 
That's it. Now this does one of two things. Firstly, it's kind of weird that it specifically lays out where you need to put stuff because frankly, you can put stuff wherever you like anyway. So it's like, oh, I must have a recipe there. Well, nothing's gonna stop me doing that. I can just do that now because there's no restriction on the board. It's kind of weird, but I suppose it just gives you a nice layout. But what I do like is that by choosing one of these blueprints, you effectively gear yourself towards a bit of strategy at the start of the game. So it helps newer players get into what they should do. Here's my blueprint. Hmm, it requires me to get three carnivorous dinosaur recipes. So already, I know I'm looking for those particular recipes. I also know I'm gonna need security, like crazy. Um, I know that I probably don't need to care too much about uh, basic DNA. I now need to get a lot more advanced DNA. And so you, you gear yourself towards a particular path with this blueprint. Or you could just ignore the blueprint entirely. You know, you need a lot of that blueprint matched to get a lot of victory points. So just doing a few of them isn't good enough. You need to focus on it. And one strategy in the game, which I've seen work just fine, is you pretty much ignore the usual method of getting victory points, like getting the people in, and you focus solely on just getting this blueprint matched. I think you can get something like 27 victory points if you match all 13 spaces on the recipe. And that's not a small amount of points when you consider most people finish on what? You know, the 50s and 60s, you know, 70s max. You know, it can make a big difference to match that blueprint. But again, just easy include, gears you to a particular path, nice little addition. Uh, on top of that, you also have, oh yes, the, the new sideboards and executive meeples. Now this one is a bit harder to include if you're new to the game. So this is the one I would probably leave out until last, but it's in no way a bad module. This allows you two things. Firstly, you have a draft session before the game starts for an executive meeple and a board. The board is this personal little board that gives you a special rule or some special thing that you can get victory points or point or money for, and it's unique to you. There's goat pens, there's a petting zoo I had before, with little baby, rap baby raptors going around. Uh, you can have a casino, you can um, incubate eggs that uh, you make the egg and then eventually it becomes a dinosaur. And there's really cool stuff like that and they all fundamentally different rules. But it's your board, it's a variable starting setup. On top of this, you also have the executive meeple. Um, the shapes that came in the box were kind of weird as the ones they picked, but effectively it's a card and it gives you a worker and it's a special power worker. So one can function like a scientist and a worker. One is a double worker. One gets you extra excitement if you use it to get a recipe and so on. So these aren't particularly complex additions either. Some of the boards are a little bit easier to work out than others and they do have a whole section in the rule book devoted to what each one does. So again, not for new players, I don't recommend that. But if you're already seasoned with Dinosaur Island, they're great fun. Variable starting setups, fantastic and you can ignore them completely and still do well. In fact, the last game I played before this review, I had a petting zoo and I focused on it entirely. I was going, ooh, look at little baby raptor and pterodactyls over there just getting cutesy and you know, role playing it up. And I focused a lot on that petting zoo. The opponent who beat me by one point because I spent too long getting money from patrons and not enough time getting victory points, you know, that's a classic error. She had the mega, mega rex, the huge T-Rex that you can build that's like super threatening but super victory point heavy. But she never did anything to it. Completely ignored the board, still won by a point. So you can have close games whether you use the boards or not. So again, more variety, more variable setups. What's not to like? And that's essentially what this expansion is all about. It's more variety for a game that's already fantastic. I'm trying to think, is there anything else I've missed? Blueprints, don't care about fifth player. Red dinos, more dice, you know, more, more stuff to add, just more variety. You've got, yeah, you got more dice, you've got more recipes, you've got more cards. Oh, PR events. PR events are quite cool. You effectively have two objective cards in your hand at the start of the game. At the end of the game, you'll choose one for everyone to score. So you have some secret information. Everybody's got secret information, but you have to bear in mind that if you're going to score for, say, getting a lot of ride attractions, how many points is everyone else getting for that? You want to have as many points as you can that the others don't. And everybody's got one of these. And again, easy include, works so well, and gears you to a path. You know, you could have the blueprint and a PR event. And the blueprint wants a lot of food stalls. And the PR event says score for every food stall you have. Perfect. There's my strategy. I'm just going to build a park full of food stalls.
great. It gets you victory points. It'll do well at the end of the game. And it's fundamentally different from simply just grabbing a million recipes and making a ton of dinosaurs. So you've basically given me more paths to victory, more variety, interesting variable player setups. What more can I say? This is a must buy if you like Dinosaur Island. I love this expansion. The only thing I don't like is the pointless fifth player, but it's such a minor include, I could not care less about it. It doesn't deduct a point from it. You know, it's just, okay, fine. If you wanna play this with five players if you're mental, then go ahead. I would love to see the table you have to fit five players on this thing. I mean, come on, it's a table hog with four. How on earth do you manage with five? But everything else, those variable players, I mean, I suppose the only minor thing I have is that there's only so many of those boards. I would like maybe a mini expansion to come out later in 2019 where they simply just go, small box expansion, here's a few more executive meeples, a few more recipes, a few more PR events, you know, blueprints, and a few more of those starting boards. You know, literally just variety, no new mechanics. And that would be perfectly satisfactory for me. I wouldn't need anything else. So yeah, definitely. If you like Dinosaur Island, there's no reason, just like with Forgotten Folk, that you would not get this expansion. It's gonna take up space on your shelf. I mean, you need two boxes to store the wretched things now, even with the inserts that are coming out from folded space and that, but definitely worth it. If you're not as big a fan of Dinosaur Island when you're playing it at the moment, then maybe this will boost it for you, I don't know, but I think you'd still need to be fans of the game to fork out the money for the expansion because it's not cheap. It's a full box expansion, so it's pretty pricey, but definitely worth it if you like the game. I guarantee it you will not be disappointed with the variety and the extra stuff that includes. It just opens up the game so much. Whew, that everything? Yep, six games new for this anthology. And this is what I'll do from time to time with the anthologies. You know, if I've got games uh, coming through, I've had two recently, um, Rise and Fall of Anvalor and uh, Rex and Carnum, I don't know, is a new one from Tom Lehman, a sort of uh, Race for the Galaxy sort of simplified card game. Um, but then I've got uh, the Stone Age Anniversary Edition coming through. I've got Narabi, a little, uh, little tile game, and Neon. You know, they're coming in the post soon. So one of the two of those I'll do a detailed review of, but for the rest, they'll probably go into the third anthology review. So there's more stuff on the way. It's just obviously been a bit slow for the market in January and Feb. But hopefully you've been enjoying the rest of the content, the tap tens, the solo plays. I've just got Coffee Roaster out and I'm doing app playthroughs as well. You can find me also on Board Game Breakfast where I'm contributing a Board Game Pro to go through the apps in more truncated like two minute detail as opposed to the full on solo play. Check those out as well and lend me your comments on there. And yeah, just generally, thanks for being who you are. Great viewers. So that's it for me. I'll see you on the next Broken Meeple video. And remember, it's only a game. Take care. Have a nice day.